In this section, we will visit the history of the field of epidemiology. Written evidence of epidemiology dates back as far as 400 BCE, where Hippocrates, in a document on air, water, and places, explains how the environment and host factors play a role in disease development. In 1662, we saw John Grant present patterns of mortality by factors such as sex, urbanicity, season, etc. And then in 1840, we saw William Farr present the first vital statistics data, which is tracking deaths by cause. This brings us to London in the mid-1800s. To explain where epidemiology as a science was founded, we visit the Thames River. At this time, sewage, as well as garbage, animal corpses, etc., were thrown directly into London's Thames River, and unfiltered drinking water flowed directly from there to pumps throughout the city. In fact, in July and August of 1858, the Great Stink was so bad that Parliament actually had to dismiss an ongoing meeting because the stench from the Thames was so strong. You can see depictions from Punch magazine here that talk about what a drop of Thames water may look like or the how the Thames smelled to the individuals in London. At this time, cholera was a major cause of mortality. Cholera is a disease that results in diarrhea often associated with nausea and vomiting. They saw up to 50,000 estimated deaths per season which is a rate of approximately 20 per 1,000 population. The theory at that time was that cholera was caused by miasms or air pollution that existed in the city. And they noted anecdotally that areas closer to the river often had worse air quality and also had increased incidence of cholera. Of note, we now know that cholera is caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholerae and is spread by contaminated water. You can see in this photo here depictions of cholera beds often used in resource-limited settings, where patients would have so much trouble getting up to use the bathroom in a timely manner that they actually laid on beds with a strategically cut hole to catch the waste. An individual by the name of Dr. John Snow carried out what we now refer to as boots-on-the-ground epidemiology. In the summer of 1854, cholera was back with a vengeance, and Dr. Snow was convinced that it was actually an intestinal germ and not miasms that was responsible for the disease. So the fieldwork that he carried out was as follows. He personally visited every home in which a cholera death had occurred in the area surrounding his home and established their water source. You can see a depiction of the map that he had created in which every red dot represents a house in which a cholera death had occurred, and the blue dots represent the pumps from which people drew their drinking water. Now also in London at this time, the British Parliament had established that water suppliers must move their water sources outside of central London. This was not because of a recognition of the importance of clean drinking water, but instead because people had been complaining about the smell as well as residue in their water. There were two prominent water companies at the time. The Lambeth Company, which complied with the act and began to draw water from upstream of the city, and the Southwark and Vauxhall Company, which continued to draw water from central London. Now, it was impossible to tell from a map which company supplied which neighborhood, such that adjacent areas could actually be supplied by different company. You can see on the table on this slide the results of what John Snow learned based on houses that were supplied by the Southwark and Vauxhall Company versus those supplied by the Lambeth Company. Of the 40,000 houses that were supplied by the Southwark and Vauxhall Company, he noted over 1,200 cholera deaths which resulted in a rate of 315 deaths per 10,000 houses. From the Lambeth Company, of the 26,000 houses, there were 98 deaths, or a rate of 37 per 10,000 households. You can see here the dramatic difference in what happened when the Lambeth Company began drawing water from upstream of the City of London. This work by Dr. John Snow really established what we now consider the basic science of epidemiology. 
Around the same time, we moved to the General Hospital of Vienna to see another example of epidemiology in action. The General Hospital of Vienna was a premier obstetric hospital that trained physicians from all over the world. There were two clinics within the obstetrics department. Clinic 1 had male obstetricians and medical students that performed deliveries. They also had an additional responsibility of performing autopsies on the women who died during labor. In contrast, Clinic 2 was staffed by midwives who also performed deliveries, but their responsibilities did not include the performance of autopsies. Clinic assignment from the patient perspective was merely based on day of admission. There was no differentiation by case severity or previous illness history. It was well known that mortality rates in Clinic 1 were substantially higher. In 1846, the Clinic 1 mortality was 11.4%, compared with Clinic 2 mortality of 2.7%. Now, did the general population notice this difference? Absolutely. In general, women would actually delay hospital arrival or give birth in the field to try to avoid being admitted to Clinic 1 and be admitted instead to the midwives' clinic. The hospital administration did try to put in place some preventive measures. They introduced ventilation and sunlight to reduce cosmic or environmental influences, but unfortunately, these interventions did not help. So this brings us to the contributions of Dr. Ignaz Schemmelweis. Schemmelweis had a colleague, a pathologist, who cut himself during an autopsy and then died of an illness that resembled puerperal or childbirth fever. Now, at this time, doctors did actually wash their hands with soap after performing autopsies, but their hands still very much smelled. Schemmelweis introduced a chlorinated lime wash, which eliminated the smell. In 1847, Schemmelweis forced his interns to wash their hands with this chlorinated wash after performing all autopsies. Did this make a difference? It appeared to. If you look on the graph, you can see the rates of puerperal or childbirth fever that occurred in the Clinic 1, which is represented in pink, versus Clinic 2, which is represented in blue. And as a reminder, Clinic 1 was staffed by the physicians and medical students who also performed autopsies. And in contrast, Clinic 2 was staffed by midwives who did not perform autopsies. It was in about 1840 that the clear division of physician staffing clinic one and midwives staffing clinic two occurred. At that point, you can notice the marked difference in the rates of puerperal fever between the two clinics. In approximately 1848 was when Schemmelweis introduced his compulsory chlorine hand wash. And you can see after that, that the rates of puerperal fever in the two clinics converge and come down to more of what was the original rate of clinic two. Again, this is now considered quintessential epidemiologic work that still is used as a model for the prevention of hospital-based infections. So we come to our question, are our public health workers today equipped to do work like this? So let's go back to a preview of our exercise for this course. Think about a public health organization that you either work with or are familiar with. Do you think the staff that are working in this organization would be able to conduct an epidemiologic inquiry similar to what Dr. Snow or Dr. Schemmelweis did? Take a moment to consider this, and we will come back in a subsequent section to talk more about what public health practitioners are expected to do and where epidemiology fits into this work.